Hey, welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're going to build a dog guessing game using React and Tailwind. Here's a sneak preview of the finished product of what we're going to build together step by step. So you click the play button, you get a 30 second countdown and you can make, well, you can only make two mistakes, but you know, three strikes and you're out. So you have to guess the breed for this dog. I'm gonna guess this one, cool. I have no idea. Uh, nope, nope, nope. Oh, okay, okay. I do not know this one. Okay, so I got, you know, three strikes are out. So instead of losing because I ran out of 30 seconds, I lost because I made three strikes. My score was four. We're saving your all time high score to local storage. So even if you refresh the page, you know, visit it a week later, let me lose on purpose it remembers your high score of four or whatever you got. You can click play again and it resets. So before we start building this together step by step, I wanna first explain who this video is for. So this video is probably not for you if you've never even heard of React before, but as long as you've heard of React, you know that it's a front end library, you're familiar with JSX, uh, right? So it's a JavaScript syntax that looks like HTML. As long as you're familiar with those basics, I think you'll be able to follow along with this video. Cool, having said all of that, I hope this video helps you wrap your mind around building something truly interactive with React and Tailwind. Without further ado, let's jump into the action. Okay, so it all begins with this empty canvas or starter repo that I've set up. So this is already using Vite with the default React setup, but I've also integrated Tailwind. Beyond that, there's nothing else in these files, so this is just a really quick way to get up and running with you know, live reload for both React and Tailwind. So you can either clone the repo or click this button, download the zip, but either way, here I have that folder from GitHub open in VS Code. So once you have it, you would just run an npm install. Once that finishes, then you would just run an npm run dev. Okay, and then you would just go to your browser and in a new tab, visit localhost colon 3000 and that's it. So we see this hello from React in a large purple or indigo font. So to change that, you just go into the SRC folder, jump into app.jsx and that's it. So you can start changing the Tailwind classes, right? So we could change this from text indigo 500 to, you know, green. And to show you, if I save that in real time, notice in the background, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to click refresh. It doesn't even actually reload the page, right? It just injects the newest code completely on the fly. Cool, so at this point we have React, we have Tailwind, let's get to work. So where should we begin? Well, before we worry about the HTML or Tailwind CSS styling, let's first worry about the data that our app is going to need. In other words, if we're building a dog guessing game, we're going to need lots of random photos of dogs. So how are we going to get those photos? Well, we're going to use the dog API. So here's the address for the dog API I'm using. This website offers lots of different endpoints. So for example, you know, this endpoint will give you just one image at random. But if we're building a guessing game where it shows you four images and you have to guess the correct one, and you know, potentially you're going to be seeing a new question like that every couple of seconds, we're going to need a lot of images. So not just one at a time. So from this website, if you click on documentation, and then I'm gonna click this random image link. Cool, so yeah, that's the endpoint that just gives you one single image. But if you scroll down, we see this endpoint and the example says three, right? And that's going to give you three images at random, but it says the max number is 50. So if you just take this URL in a new tab, paste it in, but change the end from three to 50 and cool, that's really all we need, right? So now each time we hit up this endpoint, we're going to get 50 images at random. So you refresh, you get a new 50. So go ahead and copy this URL with the 50 at the end, copy that into your clipboard. And now let's just programmatically fetch that data from within our app. Now the question is, when should we fetch it? Well, I don't wanna wait until a user clicks some sort of start playing button. Instead, I wanna start fetching that data as soon as the page loads. 
So that way, when they click Start Playing, we can start the game that millisecond instantly. The data will already be ready. So a common way of fetching data when your app first renders is to use Use Effect. Don't worry, I realize that as of late, that's become a bit of a controversial topic. We will address that in just a moment. But to get started, up at the top, let's say Import, curly the brackets, Use Effect from React. Okay, and then inside our app function, right above return, let's just say use effect, A comma B. For the B, it would just be an empty array, right? We wanna load this just the first time the app renders. We will adjust this later so that it's not empty because 50 images isn't going to last us forever, right? If the user goes through enough questions, we're going to need to load another 50 and another 50, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. For now though, instead of the A, this would just be a function. So, you know, arrow symbol. Okay, and now let's load the JSON from that dog API URL. Instead of using Axios, let's just use the web browser's built-in fetch. I like to use the async await syntax. So in order to use await, we need to be inside an async function. You cannot make this top level function in your use effect asynchronous. So what I like to do is just you know, inside this function, spell out another function that is async. So, you know, async function, you can name it anything. Let's name it go. And then right after the definition, just call it immediately. But then in that function, we could say, you know, const, uh, let's make up a name of picks promise, right? Because that's what fetch is going to return. So that equals, and then await fetch. In the parentheses, just quotes, and then paste in your clipboard. Okay, on a new line. Let's just make up another variable. Let's say picks equals and await picks promise and then call the JSON method. And then just to make sure it's working, let's log that data to the console. However, I can save you a little bit of time and let you know that the data that the dog website returns, the part that we're really interested in lives within this property called message, right? So message has the array of URLs. So let's actually just log that. So I would say console, dot log picks dot message let's give that a save and test it out so back in our browser if you open up your console cool we see an array with 50 values in it so you can expand that and there are the urls however you'll notice that that got logged twice and even if you manually refresh the page well there it is 50 images getting logged once and 50 images getting logged twice so what in the world is going on? Well, this is why a few moments ago I said that using use effect has become a bit controversial as of late. So let's talk about that. Well, first of all, before we get into it, you'll only see this doubling up of your use effect if you're using strict mode in React and you're in development instead of production mode. So let me explain. If you go into the source folder and you go into main.jsx, so this boilerplate code down here that we didn't write, you can see it's rendering our app component, but notice it's wrapped inside of strict mode. So for example, if you removed this wrapper of strict mode, you wouldn't see your use effect getting called twice. It would just be getting called once like you would expect. Also, if you actually built and distributed your React app, it would be in production mode instead of development mode. And again, in production mode, you would never see the doubling up of use effect. So. You're only going to see it in strict mode in development, which means it's really just for our own debugging purposes. It's really just to make sure that we're building robust, you know, well thought out applications. So let's talk about why in the world is it doubling up our use effect. I'm not gonna lie, when I first read through the answers and documentation, it wasn't making perfect sense. But then I saw this one post uh, by Dan Abramov on a GitHub issue. And I don't know why, but this simple explanation just instantly made it click and instantly made it make perfect sense. So what's going on in strict mode? Well, it mounts your component, but then almost immediately it unmounts it and then remounts it. Now, why in the world would it do that? Well, it's a debugging tool to make sure that our apps can handle a potential race condition. So imagine you had a single page application with a router and you know a user is on page A and then they navigate away to page B and then super quickly navigate back to page A. And imagine each one of those pages has to perform its own fetch to request some data. But a fetch doesn't happen instantly, right? That can take up to a second or two. 
So the idea is that when a component gets unmounted, you need to cancel, right? As Dan says right here, you need to cancel or abort that network fetch request because who knows how long it could take to finish. And if a user navigates away from a component, right? So the component unmounts, but now you still have some fetch request running in the background. And once it finishes, it's potentially going to change state, even though that component isn't even mounted anymore. You know, and a user could potentially swap back and forth between components like that really quickly. You could imagine how that could create some really unexpected weird results. So long story short, really all this strict mode, you know, double firing of your use effect, all it's trying to do is make sure that we're following the best practice. If we go back into app.jsx, it's just trying to make sure we're following the best practice that we should have been following years ago, which is in a use effect, you should clean up after yourself. Let me explain. So in our use effect function, right? After we call go here, so we're still in the overall use effect function, you want to return something. What do you want to return? You want to return a function. So let's just have an arrow function. And you want to clean up after yourself in this function. So react is going to call this function when your component unmounts. So in other words, if someone you know visited this component, this fetch is going to begin. But if someone navigates away from this component, we would want to immediately cancel or abort this network request. And more importantly, not just the network request itself, we would also want to cancel or abort any state changes that we were making that depended on this, right? So we're waiting for this to finish. Once it actually finishes, were we going to modify state? We'd want to avoid doing that as well. So here's what I'm going to do. Inside the body of our async function that we named go, I want you to cut these three lines in there into your clipboard. Okay, and now in that function, let's set up a try catch block. So try, and then right after that, a catch block. In the try block, you can paste back in those three lines. And in the catch block, let's just say, you know, let's log to the console and say, our request was canceled. Cool, now in our cleanup function that's going to get called when this component unmounts, we would just want to cancel this network request, which is going to cause an error. So then anything that was going to await below that line, this code just won't even run, and then our catch will be executed. So how do you cancel or abort a fetch request? Well, check this out. Maybe right above our async function definition, so right about here, I'm just gonna say const and just make up a name. Let's call it, you know, request controller equals a new instance and then this we don't get to make up the name this is something in the web browser called abort controller parentheses okay now we just want to use this when we're actually performing the fetch so inside the fetch parentheses after the quotes just say comma give it an object give it something called signal and have its value just be request controller dot signal now we've sort of identified this request we can cancel it so in our cleanup function, we would just say request controller dot abort. So we can save this back in the browser, just so our console is clean and easier to read. You can perform a manual refresh. And if we look at our console, perfect. We see our request was canceled and then we just have the console getting logged once. So when we see our request was canceled, that just means right? Our catch block ran. So it means that anything that came in the try block after this fetch line will not have ran, meaning we wouldn't have accidentally changed state from a component that wasn't even rendered any longer. So all of that was just a long winded way of saying, be sure to clean up after yourself in the cleanup function in a use effect. Cool. So if we build our components in a robust way like this, where they can handle that race condition, you know, and they can clean up after themselves, then we can rest assured that even with React's new concurrent mode, we're not going to encounter any weird bugs in our app. Now, I realize we spent a lot of time on this simple network request, but that's because a lot of people got really confused and even really upset about this use effect, you know, remounting strict mode feature. And some people even got so upset that they even started saying things like you shouldn't fetch data in a use effect. And while there certainly is a correct argument to be made that use effect is not the ideal or perfect place for fetching data, if you compare it to 
you know, like a state management tool or a fetching tool, a third party tool. The fact remains that if you don't want to use a third party tool, you just want to use React itself, then yes, use effect is still the correct place to fetch data. And you don't have to take my word for that. You can look at the current React documentation, right, for the use effect hook. The very first, literally the first example they give for using use effect is data fetching. And that's the current React documentation. If you look at the future or the beta upcoming React documentation, again, they're talking about, you know, use effect, the remounting feature and how to fetch data. Well, look no further. So they're literally saying that that's a valid example, you know, fetching data inside a use effect. So I don't know. I saw some videos on YouTube. I'm not going to say they were clickbait necessarily, but I saw a lot of doom and gloom videos, uh, you know, people just saying, don't use use effect for data fetching, just causing a lot of panic and fear, which I didn't feel was valid. So if you want to use a third party tool to fetch your data, to avoid waterfalling and all sorts of issues, yeah, that exists in complex apps, but for simple applications, I don't think you need to worry. You can continue to follow the official React documentation and use use effect for data fetching. Cool, so the sky is not falling. Uh, let's go ahead and move on. So at this point, we have our array of 50 dog images. So next, let's think about how we would create a question, right? A question is just, you show four dog images in the name of one breed, and you have to click on the correct photo. Now, in order for a question to make sense, that means there can only be one image of the correct breed, meaning there can't be any duplicate breeds, you know, in a four dog question. Now, in order to make sure that you don't have any duplicates like that, there's a million different ways that you could program things. So you could just store all of the dog images in a giant array and then uniquely pick four at a time. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to always select the first four images in the array, and then I'm just gonna chop those off the array so that for the next time we're building a question, you can again just take the first four from the array. So in order for that simplistic approach to work and to make sure that there are no duplicates, I'm just going to filter the entire array of 50 images so that there are no duplicates. So that might shrink it down to, you know, only like 36 images or, you know, 39 or 40 images. I'm fine with that. Okay, so step one, I wanna filter the duplicates out of the list. Step two, I wanna make sure that the number of URLs we end up with is a multiple of four, right? Because we're showing four dogs per question, so I want it to end in a multiple of four so that there's not like one left over because then an image from the first request could be duplicated in the second request and you might get an awkward situation where, you know, there's two poodles in the same question. So let's make those two things happen, right? We've got this array of 50 images. We want to filter out the duplicates and shave it off so that it ends in a multiple of four. To stay organized, let's create a totally separate function for that behavior. So literally, we don't even need to have this function inside of our component function. So way up here, even outside of our component, we could just say function and make up a name. Maybe let's call it, you know, only unique species, parentheses, curly brackets. And then the idea is that this function would return an array. So then down in this code, right, picks is the array of 50. Well, actually the property called message. Let's get rid of this console log line and instead say, you know, const maybe unique picks. I'm just making up a name equals and then we would call only unique species and give it picks.message. Cool, and then just to test, we could log that to the console, right? So log unique picks. So now the idea is let's just build out this function. So in the parentheses, you could say, you know, picks. And now the idea is we want to filter out any duplicates and then have it be a multiple of four and then just return that array. Whoops, and this has nothing to do with programming, but I named it species instead of breeds. So you could just change the function name only unique breeds and then change it down here when we're calling it, right? So only unique breeds. Cool. So now in this function, let's actually build our features. Again, there's a million different ways you could do this to filter out the duplicate breeds, but here's what I'm going to do. Let's make up a variable and call it unique breeds and have it be an empty array. Now I'm just going to loop through the array of URLs 
and sort of build a unique list of all the breeds and that way we can check to see if you know one of those already exists or not so let's do this let's say const unique picks equals picks filter right every array in javascript has access to the filter method in the parentheses you give it a function let's use an arrow function with just one parameter we'll call it pick so arrow symbol curve the brackets and now when you use filter the idea is that in the body of our function here if you return true the current item that's been looped to will be included in the new array that we're building if you return false it'll be skipped so here's what i'm going to do first of all i want to figure out what the breed of the current dog is now if you look at the different urls we're getting from the api they all follow this same pattern right it's images.dogs ceo slash breeds slash and then the actual breed slash and then the file name so since they all follow that pattern, here's what you could do. You could say const breed equals, take that URL, split it into an array based on a forward slash, and then just in that array, look for the fifth item, or four because it's zero based. Cool. So essentially now we have this variable called breed, and that's going to be, you know, like retriever flat coated, or pointer German long hair, so on and so forth. So now with that, on the next line, I'm just going to write an if statement. So if parentheses, curly brackets. And essentially, before we even write out the condition, this if is basically going to say, if that breed doesn't already exist in our list of breeds that we're keeping track of, then we want to include it in this new array that we're building. So you would return true. But in addition to that, so right above that, I want to add it to our collection that we're keeping track of. So I'd say, you know, unique breeds push the current breed of the current dog okay and then for the actual condition well i would say let's begin with our unique breeds array and use the includes method so does it include the current breed for the current dog and then i would just check for the opposite of that with an exclamation so only if the current dog does not already exist in the array and then i'll actually tack on another condition and i'm going to say I don't want to include the image if it includes a space in the file name because I don't want to have to bother, you know, converting the space into percent sign 20 because browsers get confused uh, and the URL will look broken for most web browsers. So I'm just going to say, you know, only if not pick includes an empty space. Cool. So that filters out any duplicates. Now below this line, but still in the function, so right here, now let's return the array, right? The function needs to return something, but let's make sure that it's a duplicate, or excuse me, a multiple of four, right? So that there's not like one image left over in the collection each time we chop four off. So that way we can guarantee there won't be any duplicates breeds when you combine the next 50 and the next 50. So I'm just gonna say unique picks, and this is what I'm returning. Use the slice method. So I'm going to begin at the start of the array, and then how far do I want to go? Well, all the way to the end, like I want almost all of the 50 images in the array or however many unique ones are left, but I just want it to end in a multiple of four. So I would just say math floor, call that, and then the length of the entire array. So unique picks dot length divided by four, so essentially, imagine if there were 17 pictures, right? You divide that by four, you're gonna get four and a quarter. So then I'm using math floor to round that down. So it would just be, you know, four. And then at the end of that, you can just multiply that by four. That would get you 16, right? So 17 would get rounded down to 16. So it's a multiple of four. I'm sure there's a much more efficient way of doing this, but I don't have a degree in math. So this is good enough. At this point, let's save this and test it out. So I'm gonna refresh in the browser. And yep, cool. So notice now our array is not of 50, there's only 40. And if you refresh, you'll see it's a different number each time, right? So 40, four, well, it's, <laughs> it's four, okay, that time it's 44, right? So it's completely random now, but the idea is there are no duplicates and it's going to be a multiple of four. Cool. At this point, we are now ready to not just log that to the console, but let's actually build a question. Now, when we build our question with four images and the correct breed answer, we're going to want to store it in state. 
So let's first actually set the stage for how we're going to work with state in this app. If you've watched my other React video from two months ago, it was 90 minutes long and it's entirely about the concept of state in React. So if you're just looking for the basics on state, I would suggest watching that video instead. In this video, I want to show you my preferred way of working with state, which is React's concept of a reducer combined with the power of Immer.js. If you've never heard of Immer before, that's okay. You'll see how it works in just a minute. So how do we start using it? Well, if you're using my Vite and Tailwind boilerplate setup, in the package.json file, I've already included Immer and use Immer reducer. So essentially up at the top of this file, we would just say import, you know, curly brackets, use Immer reducer from, and the package name is use dash Immer. This is very, very similar to React's built-in use reducer, only Immer makes working with state a lot easier. Essentially, it gives you a draft of state that you are free to directly mutate. So you can avoid a lot of that awkward, you know, creating a new separate copy of state because you're not supposed to directly mutate state, so on and so forth. I'm a big fan of it. Now to actually start using use Immer reducer, let's just go into our app component and right at the very start of it, let's say const square brackets, let's say state comma dispatch, and that equals use immer reducer. In these parentheses, we're gonna give it two things. So a comma b, the first thing we give it is a function that acts as a reducer. So a function, you can name it anything, let's name it our reducer. The second thing we give it is our initial state. So let's just create a variable, you can name it anything, but I'm gonna name it maybe initial state. Cool, so now right above our app component, our function app component right here, let's just say, you know, const initial state equals an object. And let's just spell out everything that we know our game is going to need. So for example, right, when you first start the game, you have zero points and you have zero strikes. And before you click the start playing button, you know, time remaining would be zero. Uh, let's say your high score is zero. Let's say big collection. So this will be where we store all of the images for the different dogs. Uh, so we'll just set that to be an empty array at the be very beginning. Now let's say comma, let's have a property called current question. Set that to null. Let's have a property called playing and this is just true or false. So essentially, you know, have you clicked the start playing button or has the game ended, right? Is the game, is the countdown actually Counting down, are you actually playing the game or is the game sort of paused? True or false? And then finally, let's have another property called fetch count and set that to zero. Essentially, we can just increment this anytime we wanna fetch another 50 dog images. Cool, so this is our initial state. Now let's create a function and name it our reducer. So right above that, you can just say function, you know, our reducer, parentheses, curly brackets. In the parentheses, let's have two parameters, draft comma action. Now, here's how Immer works. So, you know, usually in React, you don't directly mutate the state. Uh, and if you're working with an object with lots of different sub properties, it can get a little bit awkward because you have to get creative, right? So you could use the spread syntax. There's lots of different creative ways of like copying or sort of rebuilding your own new version of state because you don't want to directly mutate state. Well, because we're using Immer, Immer gives us draft and we are free to directly change and mutate draft. I'm a big fan of this because I feel like it really reduces the amount of code and like re-spelling out every little detail that we need to do. So for our first example, let's do this. Remember down here when we're fetching the images and then we have our function that's gonna filter out the duplicates. Instead of logging that to the console, let's actually save that into state. So remember in our state, we have this property called big collection. So let's add all those unique dog images into this array. So here's how you would do that. In our reducer, you spell out different action types. So you start in the reducer with a switch, parentheses, curly brackets. The thing that we're switching based on is action.type. 
So the idea is that our application will dispatch different types of actions and then we just spell out the details for each different type here. So I'm totally making this up, but let's add a case for a name of add to collection. This could have been anything. There's nothing special about this name, uh, but then just colon. And now because we're using Immer, normally in a reducer, you would have to return the new value. But with Immer, you can just return nothing. Uh, but right before that, you're free to directly mutate draft. So we could literally just say, you know, draft dot big collection push, right? And just directly add on to that existing array. If we weren't using Immer, you could never do this, right? In React, you're not supposed to directly change the previous state. But in this case, we can change the draft. And then we don't have to return it. Draft will just be used automatically. So in these push parentheses, it would just be action dot value. And now let me show you how you actually trigger or use this reducer. So if we scroll down to the code where we were actually fetching that data around line 45, right? Instead of logging that to the console, you can get rid of that line. We would instead say dispatch. We're calling dispatch, right? That exists from this line of code when we set up use Immer reducer. In the parentheses for dispatch, we're we give it an object. We say that type should be, and remember we made up the type name of add to collection, comma, give it another property of value, and that would just be unique picks. This may seem like a lot of work for just this first example of using dispatch, but essentially the larger your application and the more complex your application is, the more value you're going to get out of this dispatch setup because now throughout our entire application, we don't have to worry about the details of how state is getting changed. We can just dispatch an action and all of the logic can live inside our reducer. And even just for a simple dog guessing game like this, this is really nice. All of the game's you know, business logic, all of the details of how state should change, all of that can live in this one unified place. Now, just to make sure that everything so far is working, why don't we add a button into our actual interface that says, you know, dump state to console, just so you can see the full state object in your console whenever you want to. So maybe, for example, down at the bottom in the JSX that we're returning, uh, you can get rid of the heading level one and let's just have, you know, a button that says log state to console. And then when you click the button, let's have an on click equals curly brackets, just have an arrow function and just say console.log state. So give that a save, you can refresh. So you see the console doesn't have anything, uh, but as soon as we click on that, check the console. Awesome, so points zero, strikes zero, high score, everything's zero, but big collection has an array with 40 items in it. Perfect, so our setup is working. Now we can actually start to build the game, right? We've got our data, we've got the way that we wanna work with state set up and running. Now we can truly get to work. So why don't we begin by adding a button here that says play or start playing. So here's what I would do. In our JSX, you can totally leave that button that we just added in place, but because I want our design to look good, I'm actually gonna get rid of it uh, because I wanna vertically center the start playing button. So I would start with a paragraph. Inside the paragraph, let's have a button that just says play. And let's make the button look nice. So I would say class name equals, let's make the text white, let's make the background a gradient. So I'd say BG gradient to bottom. So we're starting from the top color, let's say from indigo 500, and then a space to indigo 600 say px-4, so that's horizontal padding. Let's give it some vertical padding. Let's make it rounded. Let's bump up the text size a little bit. So text-2xl, and let's make it bold. And then to position the button on the wrapper paragraph, I would say class name equals quotes, text center, fixed position, say top zero, bottom zero, left zero, right zero, flex, Justify center, items center. 
So essentially, I'm just making sure that the wrapper paragraph takes up the full, you know, vertical and horizontal space, and then I'm telling it to center any of its content. Uh, so let's give that a save and see what it looks like visually. Perfect. Now, when you actually click the button, uh, let's tell it to start playing the game. So here's how dispatch works. I don't want to have to worry about how state should change in my JSX, and I don't even want to worry about how state should change in my event handler. I want all of that to live in my reducer. So here's what we're going to do. On the button, I'm just going to add on click equals curly brackets, give it an arrow function, and we're just going to call dispatch. All we're going to do is say type should be start playing. That's it. So now in our reducer, we just go spell out an action with this matching name, and that's where we can really think about how state should change. So remember this name, start playing. Let's go back up into our reducer. Here it is. And we would just add a case. So, you know, just a new case for start playing colon. And for example, go ahead and return, but right above return, let's say, you know, the time remaining should be set to 30 seconds, right? Each time you play the game, you get 30 seconds. So draft dot time remaining equals 30. Uh, let's sort of reset the game because maybe you're playing the game a second time. So each time you start playing, we'd want to set, you know, your points back to zero, your strikes back to zero. Let's set draft.playing to equal true, right? You're actually playing the game now. The game has begun. And then here is the important part. So this is kind of tying everything together. Let's actually generate a question. So I would say draft.currentQuestion and now you could spell out the logic for how a question should be created right here, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to say that it should equal and then call a function called generate question. And now let's go create that function and it can live inside our reducer, right? In JavaScript, you can have a function inside of a function. So literally after our switch, right? The switch ends here. So we're still in the reducer function. I'm just going to say function and name it generate question parentheses curly brackets. And now the goal of this function is just to return something. So let's just return an object and let's think about what a question should be. So first of all, there should be a property called species, right? And this should be a little bit of text. Uh, this shows the species that the user is supposed to click on the correct image for. So this would be, you know, Labrador, Poodle. So for now, we'll just leave that to quotes. Uh, let's say comma An answer should also have a property called photos. You can just set that to empty. We'll fill that in in just a minute. And then finally, we'd want to have a property called answer. And again, just empty quotes, but this would be the correct image, right? So is it the first out of the four images that's the correct answer? Is it the third image out of the four that's the correct answer? You get the idea. If that doesn't make sense, once we actually fill in these values, I think it'll be clear. Okay, so first of all, before we return anything, but inside this function, let's generate a random number from zero to three, right? So we're just saying like of the four images, which one should be considered the correct image? So I'll make a variable, I'll name it temp random. I'm just making that up and I'd say math floor. Inside the parentheses, I'd call math random and then just multiply that by four. So math.random will give us a value that could be anywhere from zero up to like 0.99 so it can't be one you know but it could be 0.999 or whatever so the idea is you multiply that by whatever you want so in this case four so because this will never be exactly one we know that timesing that by four will never be four exactly it might be you know 3.99 but then we're rounding that down with math floor so essentially random number zero through three so then that random number that's what the answer value would be Right, the user's choosing between an array of four images, so zero through three, so answer, colon, just temp, random. Now, which array with just four items in it are they choosing from? Well, let's create that array. So maybe right between these two lines, I would say const, just make up a name, I'll call it just four equals draft.bigcollection, call the slice method, start from zero, the very beginning of the array, 
and then go to the fourth, well, arrays are zero based. So you're saying the ending item, but the ending item is not included. So from the start of the array up to before this item. So essentially just the array with the first four items. Okay, then that's what we would use for this value. So photos would be just four. And then finally, I don't know why I called it species again, this should be called breed. But the idea is that whatever we've identified as the correct answer, right? So a value of zero through three that's pointing at an item in this array of four, we would want the actual text value for their breed. So poodle or Labrador. So to get that, we would just say just four, look inside that array for temp random, right? That's what we've identified as the correct answer. And then remember before you can just say split that into an array based on a forward slash. And then we want, you know, an index of four or the fifth item. Cool. Now also, every time we generate a question, we would want to remove the first four items in the array, right? Because the next time we generate a question, we want a new four, the new first four in the old array. But the very first time you click start playing in the app, we don't need to remove the original four. So here's what I would do. I would just say if draft.current question, if that evaluates to true, that means a question has already been generated before, which means the game has already been started to play which means we would want to remove the first four items. So essentially every time you answer a question or you start a new game, this should run, but when the app first loads up and generates a question for the very first time, we don't need to shave off those first four items. So I would just say draft.bigcollection equals draft.bigcollection slice start with the index of four and then just go all the way to the end of the array. So essentially we're just chopping off the first four items. So draft.bigcollection.length. Cool. So to recap where we're at, remember when this action of start playing gets dispatched, we're sort of setting the stage for a new fresh game and we're generating a question. So now let's go adjust our JSX to actually display the current question in state. So if we scroll down to our JSX, First of all, let's add a bit of conditional logic to our JSX. So let's say that the start playing button should only display if you're not already playing. And then the JSX that spells out the four images, right? That shouldn't display if you haven't started playing yet. So first of all, this P element for the start playing button, temporarily cut that into your clipboard. We're going to want it back in like 10 seconds, but let's just wrap that inside of curly brackets if state.playing double equal sign false and double ampersand, let's wait to show the play button until we've actually successfully fetched data from the API. So when you very first load the screen, it can be empty because you don't wanna click on the play button if we don't have any data ready yet. So I would just say boolean where state.bigcollection.length, right? If that's greater than zero, then that means we actually have data ready. And then one more condition and and uh, let's say if you don't have state dot current question, meaning this is the very first time the app is loading up, current question is set to null, so we want to show the initial start playing button. And then finally we can have and and parentheses and then in those parentheses paste back in your clipboard. Cool. Now above that, I would have another curly bracket and say state dot current question and and parentheses. And then this will be the JSX where we show the current question, the four images of the dogs, right? So this will only display once you're actually playing the game. Let's begin with a react fragment uh, because we're gonna have multiple things inside this little bit of markup. But let's begin with the grid of the four dog images. So I have a div. Give it a class name of grid, grid calls to, uh, so two columns on like a smartphone, but then large colon or LG grid calls four. So for a larger screen, you can fit four per row and then gap five PX five. Okay, inside that wrapper div, let's show the four images for the current question. So curly brackets, state dot current question Remember it had a property called photos and then we would just wanna map or loop through that. 
In the parentheses for map, we give it a function. Let's give it an arrow function with two parameters, photo, comma, index, arrow symbol, curly brackets. Let's return a div. On the opening div tag, let's give it a key of curly brackets index. Let's give it a class name of rounded LG, height or just H-40, uh, but for larger screens, maybe LG colon height of 80, and then BG cover and BG center. Now for the actual background image itself, let's not use tailwind let's just add that property directly ourselves so i'm going to say style equals curly brackets another pair of curly brackets for a style object and then the jsx version of background image is just background capital i like this background image colon and then let's have back ticks and then css you would say url parentheses and then inside the parentheses to do something dynamic dollar sign, curly brackets, photo. Cool, let's go ahead and give that a save and test it out. I'll manually refresh just to be safe. So we don't see those, but as soon as I click play, we get an error and the entire application stops. But if we look at the console, in our generate question function, cannot read properties of undefined split. So it's almost like our big collection array just doesn't even exist. I think I know what the problem is. So if you go back into our reducer, yeah, definitely. So in our add to collection uh, case, I made a mistake here by using push. So we're not just taking individual values and pushing them onto the array. We're taking an entire array and trying to combine that onto our array. So we wouldn't just push an item onto it. We would say big collection equals draft.big collection concat, right? We're concatenating two separate arrays. We're not just adding an item onto an array. Uh, and this would just be in concat action dot value. But let's go ahead and save that and refresh and try again. So click play. Let me zoom out a little bit so we actually get the desktop view. Cool. So now in addition to just the grid of images, let's show the breed uh, you know, in the big headline text above the images. So back in our JSX, right inside this React fragment here above the grid div, I would just you know, have a heading level one. Let's give it a class name of text center, font bold, padding top three, padding bottom 10 break all text for XL. Uh, but if the screen is at least medium or larger, so MD colon text seven XL. Cool. And then in the actual, you know, for the actual content, it would just be curly brackets, state dot current question dot species. I did it again, not species, breed. Cool. Let's save that, test it out. Cool, and that's a perfect example of why this Veet boilerplate is so cool. So we didn't even have to refresh, and I didn't even lose the values of these four images in memory. It just injected the newest code without changing state, without a full refresh. So that's pretty cool for you know development and debugging purposes. But you can go ahead and manually refresh, you know, get a fresh round of data, click play. Cool. Next, let's actually add on-click event handlers so that you can try to click on the correct dog. So to do that in our JSX, look for the map area where we're looping through the different divs with the background images. And just on the opening div for each dog, I would just add an on-click equals curly brackets. And let's just have an arrow function. And then for the body of the function, we're just gonna call dispatch inside those parentheses give it an object say type and let's make up a name so for example i'll call it you know maybe guess attempt okay and then a comma and the value i'm just going to say index right so if you click a razor zero base so if you clicked on the first image that would be zero if you clicked on the second image that would be one so on and so forth so now let's just go into our reducer and set up a case for guess attempt so scroll up, here is our reducer. I would just add a new case for guess attempt colon return 
right above the return. So we would want to determine if they got the answer right or wrong. So we would have an if. Let's also have an else. And the condition would just be if action dot value, triple equal sign draft current question dot answer. So if they got it right, let's give them a point. So we would just say draft dot points plus plus. And we would also want to generate a new question, right? You got the question right, you move on to the next question. So draft dot current question equals, and then just generate a new one, right? So we have our function generate question. If they got the answer wrong, then we could just give them a strike, right? So draft dot strikes plus plus. And we can revisit this a little bit later on to add the logic that, you know, if you get three strikes, you're out. But for now, let's test this out. So if you give that a save, refresh, click play. So I'll try to get it right. I'll click on this dog. Cool, it moves on to the next question. Uh, so I'll try to get it right again. This looks like the poodle. Yep. Uh, let me get it wrong on purpose, right? So I don't think this is the setter. Oh, that actually was the setter Irish. <laughs> let me get this wrong on purpose. Okay, so cool. This one is not the Terrier Welsh. So I can click on that all day long. Nothing happens. We are getting more strikes each time, but cool. It doesn't advance to the next question. Now, before we go back and add the logic, you know, if you get three strikes, it's game over. Let's first think about what should happen when you run out of dogs to show, right? Because our first request is only going to get 40 to 50 dogs. So if you keep clicking through these, just keep getting them correct. So you might have to get like 10 or more answers correct, but eventually you're going to get an error, right? Because our array ran out of items. So how do we want to handle this logic of when should we perform a new fetch to request more dog images? There's a million different ways you could handle that, but here's what I'm going to do. Let's go into our reducer and at the bottom of our reducer, remember we have this function called generate question. So right up before this, if just at the very start of generate question, why don't we just say if, and I'm just going to check to see if our big collection of dog URLs has 12 or less items in it, I want to go fetch more. So I'm just going to say if draft dot big collection length, if that's less than or equal to 12, right? So that means do we have maybe three questions worth in reserves? If we don't, then let's go fetch more. So we can just say draft dot fetch count plus plus. Now, all we need to do to make this actually go fetch more items is just go into our use effect. So find the bit of code, you know, where we have the dog API URL. And in that use effect, we're just looking for our array of dependencies. Instead of an empty array, uh, you would just add state.fetch count. So now it's going to run the first time when the app, uh, excuse me, when the component first renders, but it's also going to run anytime this changes. Cool. So you can save this and test it out. Uh, be sure to perform a manual refresh this time, just so your old array doesn't have tons and tons of items in it, but you can click play. And now how you would test this out is in your developer tools, just click on uh, network. And to limit which items you see down here, you can click on fetch slash XHR. So that's only going to show, you know, when we're fetching new JSON data. So there is the first one that gets canceled because we're in React strict mode, in development mode. There's the one request that actually went through to give us the initial 40 or 50. But now if you just click through maybe 10 or so questions, I'll do that off camera. Cool, and there you see another request uh, to that endpoint. So this is great. We have a never ending supply of dog images now. As soon as we are getting close to running out, we just go fetch more. At this point, let's mix things up a little bit. Uh, for our next task, let's add a little bit of data up here that shows how many strikes you have left and how much time is remaining. So back in our JSX, within this area, so we have the heading level one that says the breed. Right above that, but still in the React fragment, let's have a paragraph and let's tell it to be text center. So class name, text center. And let's start with the time remaining. So I'm going to have a span and let me give it a class of, excuse me, class name of text zinc 400. So that's a shade of gray. And I'll give it a little bit of margin on the right. 
Okay, now in this span, I wanna have two things. I wanna have a logo, or I should say an icon that looks like a clock, and we can tell it to animate and spin. And then I also wanna show a number of how many seconds are left. Let's start with the icon. So here's what I would do. If you visit the Bootstrap website, in the top navigation, you can click on icons. Okay, and then if you scroll down just a little bit, we can click here to search for, you know, clock. And I like this icon, it's called clock-history. It's got a little bit of a dotted border here. I just think it'll look nice if it rotates and spins. So I'm gonna click on that. And then down towards the bottom right, you see this SVG, it's just inline HTML that we can copy. So copy that into your clipboard. Uh, back in our code. Inside the span here, just paste it in. Let's change the width and height from 16 to 32. And then let's also find class here. So in JSX, it would be class name instead of class. We don't need these values that it has, but we can add our own. So for example, let's add inline block. Actually, let's make this dynamic. So instead of just quotes, let's say class name equals curly brackets, quotes, inline dash block, and then a space. After the quotes, I wanna dynamically add something on. So what I'm doing here is I want to tell the clock to spin like rotate clockwise if the game is actively being played. But if the game's not being played, right, like if you're on the game over screen, then we don't need the icon to keep spinning. So I would just say plus, and it's important that you have the empty space here so we can add something onto it, but plus, parentheses, and then a ternary operator. So if state.playing is true, then question mark, quotes, animate spin, colon, if it's not true, just add on nothing, just empty quotes. Cool, now after the closing SVG, but still inside the span, let's have text that says how much time is remaining. So let's have another span. Let's give it a class name of font mono. Uh, I'm using this so that the width doesn't subtly change, you know, because certain numbers take up more space. Uh, so if we use a mono font, that won't happen. It won't constantly shift around. Text 4XL, relative top two, margin left three. Cool, so now I want there to be a leading zero, right? So if there's 30 seconds, 29 seconds, but if there's only five seconds, instead of five, I want it to say 05, right? And I would want there to be a zero as in, you know, zero minutes and this many seconds remaining. So here's what I would do. You can hard code the zero colon, and then what comes after the colon, let's just have curly brackets and have, again, use a ternary operator. So if state dot time, remaining is less than 10, then add a zero plus state.time remaining, colon, if that's not true, then just have state.time remaining, right? You don't need the leading zero. Cool, let's give that a save and see what it looks like. So you refresh. Actually, you didn't even need to refresh it. I, for a split second, I already saw it up there. Cool. Don't worry, in a few minutes we can set up the functionality so that it actually starts decreasing and counting down. For now though, let's display the three hearts, uh, you know, because you get three strikes before you're out. So let's go find a heart icon. So back on the Bootstrap Icons website, if you just go back here, let's search for heart. So the one that I'm going to use is called Suit Heart Fill. So just click on that. In the bottom right corner, copy the SVG code to your clipboard. Okay, and now there's a million different ways you could use this in your JSX. Because I want some of the hearts to be a bright pink and then some of the hearts to be a muted pink, or so when you first start the game and you haven't made any mistakes yet, I want all three hearts to be bright pink. And then when you make one mistake, I want one of those bright pink hearts to turn muted pink. So because I want them to be different colors, I'm actually gonna create this as its own separate component, just so we don't bloat our file and you know paste in the same SVG code twice. So let me show you what I have in mind. If you scroll up to the top, right before our app component, let's just create a totally separate component and I'm gonna name it heart icon, parentheses, curly brackets. Be sure to include props as a parameter and then just you know return parentheses, paste in your clipboard. Let's change the width and height to, instead of 16 to 30. 
and then I want you to find class. So we would change that to class name, but then hollow out all the values and get rid of the quotes. It would just be curly brackets, props dot class name. So essentially I'm just creating this as a component so that we can dynamically give it whatever color or class name we want, you know, in different situations. So now with this component ready, let's go back down into our JSX and still within the paragraph uh, that says the time, but after this span, so right here, here's what I'm going to do, curly brackets. And I'm going to start with the bright pink hearts that show you know, how many strikes you have left. So I'm going to say, start with an array, so square brackets, and then a nice way that you can loop through something X number of times in JSX is to use the spread syntax on the generic or uppercase array. And then, you know, you say how many items you would want to be in this empty array. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say three because that's how many strikes you're allowed to have or, you know, you lose on the third strike, but you get the idea. Three minus state dot strikes. So when you first start the game, there would be three bright pink hearts. You know, if you make one mistake, three minus one, then there'd be two left. And we'd want to loop through that array. Let's give it an arrow function with two parameters of item, comma, index, and then arrow symbol, curly brackets, and then just return a heart icon self-closing. Give it a key equals curly brackets of index, but then most importantly, give it a class name of inline and then text pink 600, and then give it a little bit of horizontal margin. Let's give that a save. And if we refresh, cool. Now, if I make one mistake, it's only two hearts, I make another mistake, you get the idea. If you go below one heart, it crashes, and that's just because we haven't set up the logic that, you know, when you get three strikes, you lose. But you can just manually refresh. Uh, we'll add that logic in just a minute. Now, essentially, when you get one wrong, I would want there to be a, you know, sort of grayed out muted light pink heart. So here's what I could do. Just copy and paste this entire block of code here, just duplicate it, and then in these parentheses, just get rid of the three minus, so it's just state.strikes, right? However many strikes you have, that's how many grayed out hearts we wanna show. And then all we need to change is this color class. So it would be text pink. Let's go with a muted color of just, you know, text pink 100. So you can give that a save. Cool, and there you have it. So there's the muted heart. So now it feels really intuitive. If you restart, just get a feel for what it would be like. Now it seems really intuitive as you're getting the questions wrong. Cool. At this point, let's set up the game over screen, right? So that when you do get that third wrong answer, we want sort of an overlay to appear that's somewhat transparent, you know, but it says game over, three strikes are out, you know, here's your score, here's your high score, so on and so forth. Well, first of all, let's make it so this icon stops spinning, you know, once you've made three strikes. Then we can show the full screen overlay. So I would just go into our reducer and within our case for guess attempt, so after you get a strike for the wrong answer, I would say if, and the condition is if draft.strikes is greater than or equal to three, what do we wanna do? Let's set draft.playing to now be false. Cool, so now the game is no longer in, you know, actively playing mode. And then also, you know, once the game is over and you're not currently playing it, like, you know, if you've made three mistakes, Let's make it so that literally nothing happens when you click on a dog any longer, right? Because we wouldn't want to bogusly give people extra points or like even more than three strikes or anything like that. So here's what I would do. Right at the start of this case for guess attempt, I would just say if the opposite of draft.playing, right? So if that's false, just end this case. Just do nothing. Return. But if this is not the case, then all of our other code can happen. Cool, so you can test that out. We give that a save, give it a refresh so you get a fresh three strikes. Start playing. Notice the icon spinning, but as soon as we run out of strikes, perfect, the icon stops spinning. So now at this point, this is when we would also wanna display the game over overlay. So let me show you what I have in mind uh, to make that appear. Let's go down into our JSX 
And down at the bottom, so still within the overall wrapper div, you could make this overall wrapper div just a React fragment instead of a div. But basically below this start playing button, let's add a new area and let's have curly brackets. And let's spell out a condition so that this text would only display if it makes sense to show the game over. So I'm going to have one condition in a parentheses, and I'll say if state dot time remaining is less than or equal to zero, or so double pipe if state dot strikes is greater than or equal to three. So that's the first condition. And if state dot current question. So if there's a current question, that way we don't accidentally show this when the game first starts and there hasn't even been a question generated yet. And then ampersand, ampersand, parentheses, and now this is where we can actually include the HTML for the full screen overlay. So let's start with a div. On the opening tag, let's give it a class name of fixed, top zero, left zero, bottom zero, right zero, BG black forward slash 90. So, you know, 90% opacity. And then text white, flex, justify center, items center, and text center. Cool. Now inside the div, uh, let's start with a little bit of text that says three strikes and you're out. However, the overlay will display if you got three strikes or if you ran out of time. So we'd want a condition here. So curly brackets, you know, state.strikes is greater than or equal to three ampersand ampersand and then just have a paragraph that says three strikes colon you're out and let's give that a few classes so class name equals text 6xl margin bottom four and font bold while we're at it we can add the times up uh, error message or game over message right above that so you can just duplicate that line we just wrote for the condition it would be if state dot time remaining is less than or equal to zero. And then just change the text to be time and then apostrophe times up. Cool. Now below both of those lines, but still in this div, let's have maybe a paragraph and let's have it say your score colon and then I want there to be a space and then we can have like a star icon and the number of points you earned. But if you're using the prettier extension in VS Code like I am, a lot of times it's going to delete the space automatically. So if you really want to force there to be a space, you can just have curly brackets and then just, you know, a string of text with a space like this. Uh, but then still inside that paragraph, let's say a span. Inside this span, I want to have a star icon for how many points you earned. And then I want to show the actual number of points, you know, three points, five points. But first of all, I want both the star icon and the text to be sort of a yellow gold color. So I'll say class name equals text amber 400. Now inside the span, let's go get a star icon. So back on the bootstrap icons page, just start searching or filtering for star. And this is the one I'm going to use. It's called star dash fill. So just go in there, copy the SVG code, paste it here. Let's change the width and height to 24. Let's change class to class name. We don't need any of these filler classes. Instead though, let's give it inline dash block, relative bottom one and MX one. Cool. Now below the SVG, but still in that span, let's just output the actual number, right? So did you get three points, 10 points? So that's just state.points. We haven't set up the high score functionality yet, but let's just display it as sort of a placeholder. So below this paragraph, just add one more paragraph. And let's say your all time high score colon. For now, just set it to zero. We can circle back to this later. Uh, but let's give that a class name of margin bottom five. Cool. Now below this, one last thing, let's add a play again button. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Let's just go use our original play button that we already spelled out. So if you scroll up just a little bit, remember this button, when the app first loads, it's what you click on to start playing. Just copy from the opening button to the closing button 
Just copy that into your clipboard. Okay, and then back down here where we're setting up the game over screen, just paste that in. Change the text to say play again. And then for the Tailwind classes, we can just change uh, text to XL to maybe just text LG. Let's give this a save and see what it looks like. So, whoops, it definitely shouldn't look like this, right? We don't want it all on one line. So we're clearly missing a wrapper div uh, that's going to make my flex layout work. Let me show you what the problem is. So if you go back up, right, here's that new code we wrote for the game over screen condition. So here's the overall wrapper div with the semi-transparent black background and it's using Flexbox. So we would just need sort of an inner wrapper div inside of this so that all of these different elements are sort of grouped, right? Instead of being treated as direct children. So here's what you would do. Right at the beginning of this div, so right about here, just add a wrapper div. And then to close out that div, it would just be down here. So after the closing button, we have one closing div. Just add one more closing div, just like this. Cool. So let's test it out now. Perfect. So three strikes, you're out. We can click play again, and it starts over. Let's get a couple questions correct so that we can actually see uh, our score. Cool, so I got three right, your score. We got see the star icon and then the number three. The play again button works. Cool, so at this point, let's actually have the clock begin to truly count down, right? And then when it reaches zero, that's also game over. Now the React library itself doesn't really have a concept of setting an interval or keeping track of time like this. So we're going to use the web browser's behavior, right? Set interval and clear interval. And in order to sort of hold on to the same counter that the browser is counting time with, we're going to use something in React called a ref. So to get started using that technique, up at the very, very top here, when we're importing uh, use effect from React, let's also import, so comma, something called use ref. Okay, now let's find where our app component first begins. So for me, it's around line 76, right? Our function called app. And right at the start of it, let's say const, I'm just making up a name of timer. There's nothing special about this name, but set that to equal use ref and let's just give it a starter value of null. Cool. With this now, let's set up a completely new separate use effect. So right above this use effect, I'm going to create a brand new one. Use effect a comma b. Instead of the b placeholder, we have our dependency array and we just need to watch for state.playing. Instead of the a placeholder, let's give it a function arrow, parentheses, arrow symbol, curly brackets. Okay, so first of all, I wanna wrap the entire thing in an if statement here. And the condition is only if state.playing is currently true. Now inside of there, I want to begin an interval so that every 1000 milliseconds, right, every one second, I want to decrease this amount of time remaining. Right, so 29, 28, 27. But I wanna create it in a way where we can cancel it or clear it. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say timer, right? That's our ref, timer.current. I'm not making up this name of current. This is just the standard React way of actually using your ref. But we're gonna set that to equal and just use the web browser's set interval. You give that two things. The second value is the number of milliseconds you wanna wait. And then this first thing is a function that's going to run every thousand milliseconds, right? So we would give this an arrow function. And every one second, let's just dispatch something to our reducer, right? So dispatch, say type, and let's make up a case name or an action name. Let's call it decrease time. Now below these three set interval lines, but still in our if block, uh, because we're in a use effect, let's be sure to clean up after ourselves. So you just return a function, a cleanup function. So arrow symbol. And in our cleanup function, we would just want to clear this interval, right? So the browser stops holding on to that and stops trying to run the function every second. So you would just say, you know, the browser has a function called clear interval. Which one do you want to clear? Ours is called timer.current. 
Now, just for your own understanding, what you could also do is say, you know, console.log interval cleared from cleanup. And then to also prove to yourself that we're not recreating this interval every single second, you could have, uh, you know, a console.log right here. And you could say console.log interval created. Essentially, how this works is this function in useEffect is only going to run when state.playing changes. So once we count down from 30, 29, 28, 27, all the way down to zero, up in our reducer, we can set playing to false, and that would trigger this use effect to run again. Only React, before it calls the same use effect again, it's going to call the previous version's cleanup function. Right? So in other words, it's going to call our cleanup function in preparation for running this again when it's false. In other words, our interval will be successfully cleared. Uh, so we won't just continue to run this infinitely. I realized that was super confusing, but let's go into our reducer and create an action type for decrease time. And then I think it'll start to make sense. So just find our reducer. Let's add a new case. So case for decrease time, colon, colon return. On the line above the return, I would just say if, and let's also have an else block. For the condition check, I would just say if draft.time remaining is less than or equal to zero. So if that's true, then I want to tell the game to stop playing, right? So draft.playing equals false. We're not actively playing any longer or you know freeze the time. If this is not true, that means we want to go ahead and subtract a second from time remaining. So it would just be draft.time remaining minus minus. Let's give this a save and test it out. So I'm actually gonna refresh, click play. Cool, so you can see it's actually counting down. Uh, through the magic of video editing, I'll fast forward. Uh, let's see what happens when it hits zero. Perfect, so as soon as it hit zero, it stopped counting, right? It didn't go to negative one, negative two, and our game over screen appeared. Let's try this again. Let's make sure that if you get three strikes, uh, it stops. So like if I get this wrong at 24 seconds, perfect. We get three strikes, we're out. The clock froze at 24. But if we click play again, it resets. Awesome. At this point, let's make sure that we're preloading the images. So for example, uh, let me get one right here. Notice how the images weren't immediately ready. So I think it would be nice if Anytime we're on a question, let's just start preloading the image URLs for the next two questions ahead of time. So, you know, we don't need to waste people's bandwidth and load five or 10 questions in advance. But I think even just two questions in advance is a nice happy medium. So that way, the millisecond they click on to the next game or the next question, the images are ready. To make this happen, I'm just going to set up one more use effect that watches our big collection array of images for changes. So for example, above this use effect, let's just set up another brand new separate use effect, A comma B. This time the dependency array can just be state dot big collection. Uh, the A would be a function, so parentheses, arrow symbol. Now I don't want this to run the very first millisecond our component renders before we've even completed the Ajax trip to fetch the JSON. So I'm gonna start with an if statement and say only if state.bigcollection.length, only if that evaluates to true. All right, so only if we actually have fetched our JSON data yet. But then what I wanna do is maybe for the first eight images in the array, I want to start preloading them. Right, so that should cover you know the current question and the next question. So let's start with state.bigcollection. And let's run a slice. So I want to start at the beginning of the array, and you know I'll go until the eighth item, or I should say the ninth item because arrays are zero based. But this is not included. So you know, in other words, this is saying the first eight images, and then we'll run a for each on that array. Let's give it one parameter, arrow symbol, and then in the web browser, if you want to preload a URL, preload an image, it's as easy as just saying a new instance of the web browser's image class like this. So then that new instance of the image is sort of floating in outer space here. On the end, we're interested in setting its SRC property to just equal pick, right? Whatever the URL for the dog image is. 
So let's save that and you can test it out just with your own instincts, right? So if you refresh, wait a second and click play, notice those images are immediately ready. And if you go on to the next question, see, they're just immediately ready. The other way you can test this is if you go into your dev tools, click on network, and then for this filter area, you can click on IMG, and you can set this you know, on a secondary screen or just resize your windows, but you'll see that every time you go through two questions or so, you'll see new images in here get preloaded. At this point, let's change gears and let's work on the high score feature, right? So when you see the game over screen, let's actually keep track of and display your high score. So we can use local storage to make this happen, but to get started with this, here's what I would do. So remember in our initial state, we already have a property called high score and it's just zero by default. So let's just go into our reducer and make sure we're updating this to you know the last score that you just achieved, if it would be your highest score. So let me show you what I would do. In our reducer, there's actually multiple places where you would want to check for that. So you'd want to check for it you know, when you get three strikes and the game is over, but also when time runs out and the game is over. So instead of repeating the code in multiple cases, I'll show you what you can do. Because we're using Immer, it's as easy as just, you know, at the very start of the function before the switch, let's just run this anytime our reducer gets called. Let's just say if parentheses, if draft.points is greater than draft.highscore, you know, if that's true, then just set draft.highscore to equal draft.points. I'm fine including this just anytime this function runs because this is only gonna take like one one billionth of a second to execute. Cool, so now we're checking for the high score in the places where it makes sense. Now we just wanna persist that into local storage and then when the game first loads up, we wanna load that value from local storage. So first let's set up the code that tries to load it or pull it from local storage when our app first renders. So to do that, I would just set up one more separate use effect. Let's say use effect, A comma B. This time we don't need to watch for anything. We just wanna do this when the app very first renders. And then our function, so parentheses, arrow symbol. And so we're gonna load a value from local storage, but we would want to essentially put it into our state. So let's just use dispatch, right? Dispatch, uh, let's make up a type of maybe, you know, receive high score. And the value would just be local storage, get item, and we can name it high score. Cool. Now we've already written the code up in our reducer that sets our state property that's called high score if it's actually a new high score. So now we can just write one more use effect that watches that piece of state. And anytime it changes, just save that into local storage, right? So one more use effect, A comma B, this time the dependency array would be state.highscore, right? Anytime that changes, that means the user just scored a new high score. And then for the function, it would just be parentheses, arrow symbol. Uh, let's only bother doing this if you've scored more than zero, right? So if state.highscore is greater than zero. If that's the case though, let's just write it and you know save it permanently to local storage. So local storage set item, uh, the name is high score comma, and the value would just pull from state, right? State dot high score. Cool, so we've used use effect for its true use case, right? Which is for synchronization. We've synchronized our state to local storage. Awesome, now let's just go into our JSX and make sure we're actually displaying your high score. So down, if we look for the game over screen, cool. For me, it's around line 196, so your all time, I think all time should have a dash right here. Uh, and then instead of the hard-coded zero, it would just be curly brackets, state dot high score. Let's give this a save and test it out. I'll get a clean refresh just to be safe. Click play. Let's see how many points I can get. Nope. Oh, I definitely don't know this one. <laughs> oh, I got lucky. Uh, no, I don't know this one. All right, so cool. So seven, uh, your all-time high score is seven. Now actually refresh. 
uh, to prove that that's coming from local storage, right? So we lost the browser's in-page memory, but if I end the game immediately, whoops, it is not working. So that should have said seven right there. Uh, let's troubleshoot what's going on. So off camera, I just figured out what's going on. You were probably yelling at the screen because it's super obvious. So remember, I set up a dispatch called uh, receive high score, but then I never actually went into re the reducer and set up a case for this. So we probably successfully saved the value into local storage. We just need to set this up so that we're actually loading it into state. So let's just go into our reducer. We just need to set up one more case called receive high score, right, from local storage. And all we need to do is say draft.highscore equals action.value. And then let's set sort of a default value of zero. Uh, so that way, if it attempts to read local storage and nothing is there, it's not null, but it's just actually a, a numeric zero. So I would just say if, you know, action.value is sort of undefined, then let's just set it to actually numeric zero. Let's give that a save. Awesome, so we didn't even need to refresh. This is another huge advantage of using Vite. It just injects the new code without losing your state. So there's the number I was hoping to see, high score of seven. You can really test it out, you know, if you perform a hard refresh. And if I lose on purpose, perfect high score of seven. And that actually was the last feature we need to build. So we've completed the game. That brings this lesson to a close. Really quick though, before the video ends, I wanna show you how you could deploy this application. Because yes, this localhost 3000 is cool for local development and the instant inject of the new code, but what if you actually wanna share this you know, on GitHub pages or Netlify? All you would do is go into the command line, uh, press Control C to stop the dev task, and then instead of npm run dev, you can just do npm run build. That should only take a few seconds. And now you'll have this dist folder. So that contains the files that you would push up to GitHub pages or Netlify. If you wanna preview that or test that out, you can just run a command of npm run preview. And it will tell you the port number so for me, it's localhost colon 4173. Cool, so now you're previewing, you know, the minified files that you would actually push up to the public web. Awesome, that is gonna bring the video to a close. Really quick at the end here, I wanna say that if you enjoyed this video, you might enjoy some of my premium full-length courses over on Udemy. I have an entire course about React.js, as well as a course about full stack JavaScript development, you know, with Node and MongoDB. I have a course about MySQL, so on and so forth. Anyways, that's gonna bring this video to a close. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you feel like you learned something. And stay tuned for more web development tutorials.